Hi, I'm Steve Hawkins, Director of Marketing from the Oklahoma History Center. As you've probably noticed, the backdrop for this episode of From the Collection is substantially different than what you've seen before. We've moved from the catacombs, or our basement collection, to an exhibit hall. This exhibit is called Launch to Landing, Oklahomans in Space. We're honoring and recognizing all of those Oklahomans that contributed to the aerospace program. The centerpiece of this exhibit is the Apollo CM-118. This is the largest artifact that has ever been brought into the Oklahoma History Center. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dan Provo. Hello, my name is Dan Provo and I'm the director of the Oklahoma History Center. Today, we're gonna to take a little bit different approach to our discussion of collections, artifacts. This particular artifact is actually not owned by the Oklahoma Historical Society. It's owned by the Smithsonian the National Air and Space Museum in Washington. However, we are very, very lucky to have it on a long-term loan to us from the Smithsonian. This is part of our Smithsonian affiliate status, which allows us to work with the Smithsonian in a variety of ways that's a very special relationship. We expect that this particular loan item is gonna be here for many years to come, and we look forward to sharing it with people from all over the state and all over the nation. This is a story that's been about 10 years in the making. We have long wanted to bring an Apollo command module to Oklahoma. To the best of our knowledge, only one has ever been in the state before, and that was the Apollo 11 after it landed on the moon. It made a tour of the nation and stopped briefly about a day and a half or so in Oklahoma. So this is only the second time that there has been an Apollo command module in the state, and it's a very special artifact. This one, as many other artifacts associated with the space program, has an intimate connection to Oklahoma. The pilot of this spacecraft was Bill Pogue from Okima. Of the three Skylab missions, two had Oklahomans on them, Owen Garriott on the second mission and Bill Pogue on the third. Part of the process of working with the Smithsonian is to go through an extensive period of review, of planning, of discussions, and working with a variety of the professional staff members at the Smithsonian. It's always an extraordinary experience, always one that is exciting and enlightening, and it brings a lot to the table that we hope that we're able to share with you as we talk about this spacecraft. When you look at this, this is a spacecraft that at this point in time holds a singular record. This is the spacecraft for the United States that has flown the longest continuous time in space of any United States spacecraft. It was in space for 84 days, which is a very long duration. It was the final mission of Skylab and it set several records while it was in space for 84 days. When you look at the spacecraft, you see part of its history etched into the surface of the spacecraft itself, and it was deliberately left that way. When the Smithsonian worked to clean and conserve it before sending it to us for exhibit purposes, there was a very conscious decision to protect the history that you see on the surface of the spacecraft. When you look at it, the spacecraft seems to be a simple teardrop, if you will, shape, but it is a, an extraordinarily complicated piece of machinery. All the Apollo spacecraft, the ones that went to the moon and the later in Skylab and then Apollo Soyuz, share common characteristics. So what you see with this spacecraft is true for many of the lunar missions and the other Apollo spacecraft uses. When you look at the spacecraft, you can think of it basically as three separate exterior parts. On the top of the spacecraft, there is the reentry element which while it's being uh, blasted off into space, lifted off into space, there's a shield that surrounds the very top of the spacecraft. That covers up the parachutes. It's called the Earth landing package. That's where the things that come into play when the spacecraft returns to Earth. The central portion of the spacecraft, the main body, is a general heat shield for the spacecraft. And it's an extraordinary achievement all by itself. The third part of the spacecraft is the heat shield itself, the underneath side. Because remember, when a spacecraft returns to Earth after being in space, it's subjected to extraordinary temperatures and heat as it comes back into the atmosphere in the neighborhood of 3,000 degrees. 
and the protection of the spacecraft of the astronauts with inside is always one of the paramount elements of importance to NASA and the development of the spacecraft. There is a heat shield covering the entire spacecraft and when you look closely at it you'll see a honeycomb. That honeycomb is composed of a number of cells, thousands upon thousands of cells, similar to what you might find in a beehive and a honeycomb there. Each one of those cells, and as you look closely at it, you'll see it's a little hexagonal shape. Each one of those cells is individually hand-filled using a syringe to inject an epoxy resin into that particular cell. The entire skin of the spacecraft is covered in that. It'll range in depth from about a half an inch to about two inches, with the thicker parts being at the bottom of the spacecraft that bears the brunt of re-entry into the atmosphere. So it's an extraordinarily complicated, very high-tech protective shield, if you will. You'll also notice that it has windows in it. These are very, very special windows made by Corning, and these are highly resistant to heat. Uh, remember, 3,000 degrees on the exterior of the spacecraft at the base. The sides of it, the heat isn't quite that intense, but it's still significant. So the windows have to be specially made to stand up to those heat effects as well. When you look at the spacecraft as well, you're going to see, I think, 14 different panels. Those panels set within the skin of the spacecraft themselves were all fastened down using special screws. The hatches themselves were shielded with a special rubber compound. It was a red rubber called an RTV compound. And that was, again, highly resistant to heat. You'll see parts of that in different parts on the surface of the spacecraft still. Even though the screws for the hatches and for the access panels have been largely removed, you'll see the holes where those were, and those have been left just like that. That was something that was done after the spacecraft returned to Earth because the spacecraft itself was subjected to extensive testing and measurements and a whole variety of things to, again, learn as much as possible from the experience of launching the spacecraft into space and then having it in space for such a long time. You'll also notice on the surface of the spacecraft multiple colors. The bottom of it, the aft heat shield, the most obvious thing you see there is the darkness, the black charring. This was anticipated, as it is with all spacecrafts returning to Earth from this time period. The special resin on the heat shield was designed to bleed away. It's called an ablative heat shield. And it was designed to carry heat away as the spacecraft was re-entering. What you see are charred remnants of that heat shield still in place. And there'll be some areas where it appears to be gone completely. Now, what happened with that, the scientists believe, is that the spacecraft heat shield was, of course, very hot when it splashed down in the ocean. The combination of heat and impact with the water may well have broken some components of that away. And that's why you'll see a different texture and some areas of the heat shield that appear to be missing. The spacecraft was safe, the astronaut occupants were safe, but again, remember, this is part of a very rough impact and journey back to the Earth. You'll also see different colors on the spacecraft, some white, some silver, uh, some painted surfaces. Part of this was done in order to shield the spacecraft and anticipate the impact of a long-duration spacecraft with direct exposure to the sun, which of course is much more intense. So the white and the silver are part of NASA's efforts to mitigate the impact of heat and sun on the spacecraft itself as it was in space for that long duration. There are also strips of what appear to be tape, and that's in fact what they are. It's a special tape called Kapton tape. And this was part of an application to the spacecraft, again, before it lifted off, another protective surface, but part of that surface burned off during re-entry. You see some parts of it remaining, some parts are gone. Again, that's part of the re-entry process. Around the base of the heat shield itself, you'll also see what appears to be white powder. And that, in fact, is two different things. Part of that is, remember, the heat shield bleeding off as it came down. Part of it is salt.
from the impact within the ocean, the drying of salt water on the surface of the spacecraft, so there's a little bit of a salt deposit on the exterior of that. That's one of the, the kind of fun things to look at when you look at the spacecraft. Again, we talked initially about the top of the spacecraft. This is where the Earth landing portion is. And if you look around the upper ring, which is the ring that forms the docking mechanism to attach the spacecraft, in this case to Skylab, in other Apollo missions to the lunar lander. When you look around that ring, you'll see three of the sections up there, three of four sections. Three of the sections have uh, webbing, if you will, little strips, and those sections are where the parachutes were attached to this top of the spacecraft to slow its impact to the ocean to help it make a safe return to Earth. Those were on three of the four sides, and the cavities next to them are where the space uh, uh, the parachutes were located before they were deployed. When the spacecraft came down, it was suspended from those three parachute points. The angle it came down was at 28 degrees, which is important because it didn't come down flat onto its back. It came down at an angle so that the impact within the ocean was lessened. So all these things are very deliberate in how you look at the spacecraft. Part of the other thing that you want to look at is on the back side from the hatch. There's a couple of special features there, one of which is a square area, and that's where the spacecraft's umbilical cord to the service module was attached below it. Remember, the spacecraft was up in space for 84 days, and the spacecraft like these made the return trip to the moon and back. However, the spacecraft itself is not big enough to sustain people for multiple days at a time. So it was attached to something called a service module. That's where air, fuel, other things of that sort were stored and then fed back into the spacecraft through the umbilical that was attached to this point. When the spacecraft returned to Earth, the service module separated and then burned up upon re-entry because it was not protected and it was not on a parachute. The spacecraft continued on within the atmosphere down to the surface of the ocean. That umbilical was its critical lifeline while the spacecraft was in space and on other Apollo missions. You'll also notice towards the top of the spacecraft an area with two circles. This is part of the extraordinary nature of the spacecraft and a little bit of a surprise to many people. Those two circles, one is for a telescope and one is for a sextant. A sextant was an instrument developed in the mid-1700s to navigate ships and parties on land and other things, and sextants were still used in space uh, as an additional method of navigation. So when you look up there, one for a sextant, one for a telescope, the uh, hatch is not on the spacecraft. It's been disassembled from it, and so we're not showing that. We will, however, be discussing more in the future about the interior. Another of the elements about this spacecraft that makes it very special is that the interior is intact. All the couches, the thruster controls, the control boards, everything is there. That wasn't always the case after spacecraft flew. Many times when they were returned to Earth, NASA would disassemble them, parts would be used on other missions or in other circumstances, but since this was the next to the last Apollo that flew, it was not disassembled in the same way and parts and pieces were not removed from it. So you have an opportunity to see within the spacecraft an essentially intact command module interior. That's a, a remarkable opportunity and we'll be highlighting that in the future as people visit the exhibit and take a look at what they see inside the spacecraft. You'll also notice on the exterior of the spacecraft a variety of what appears to be circle and oval shapes. Those are areas for thruster rockets to control the, the attitude of the spacecraft to help maneuver different things of that nature. So there's a number of features on the exterior of the spacecraft that are really special and you don't often get to see. You'll notice on the edge of the heat shield there are two areas that are a bright white material. Those are actually antennas and it's a special glass just like the windows are a special glass. On the left side of the spacecraft, when you look at it facing the hatch, there is a third antenna component. Uh, 
It should be white, but it's been blacked out. We don't know why, but you can see the circle that's right there. As you look at the spacecraft, you may notice at various places, particularly along the border of the heat shield, a number of circles, a half inch to an inch in diameter. Those circles are areas where there were imperfections found in the heat shield. It might have been a crack, a bubble, a void, something that ended under testing before the spacecraft was launched, the scientists and engineers decided it wasn't quite right. So those areas were removed. They were drilled out and then refilled in order to make sure that the heat shield was intact and could appropriately do its job to keep the astronauts safe within. Part of the story of bringing the Skylab Apollo CM118 here is the story of how it got from its home at the National Air and Space Museum to the History Center here in Oklahoma. It's a, an extraordinary story. It's a complicated story that involves a great many different people. This is not something that you do on a normal basis. Transporting flown spacecraft across the country is a, a very special endeavor and it requires a great deal of planning. Multiple states, multiple police jurisdictions, multiple interactions with different highway departments and a whole host of different individuals. Once it gets to its location, in our case the History Center, it's very, very large. It's bigger than any door that we have within this building. However, when we were planning the History Center, we anticipated bringing in big things that wouldn't fit through normal doors. And we made a provision with the History Center in the atrium to be able to take off a portion of the glass end wall of the building. And that's in fact what we did to bring the spacecraft into the building. The spacecraft itself measures 12 feet 10 inches across and 10 feet 7 inches in height. The opening that we have in the side of the building that we can create is 13 feet across. So you have a 1 inch latitude on either side of the spacecraft to bring it into the building and less because the spacecraft was wrapped with insulation and protective coverings, we only had a half inch latitude when we brought it into the building. We had the wonderful opportunity to work again with Allied Steel. They've been partners with us in moving other large objects into and around the History Center. They worked with our other partners from the Cosmosphere in Kansas, another Smithsonian affiliate, to bring the spacecraft into the building with very, very fine tolerances. Another fact that's of interest is that this is an exceptionally heavy artifact. The artifact with its base is about 11,500 pounds. So part of the review process included going back to the structural engineers for the History Center, Wallace Engineering out of Tulsa, and sharing with them our plans, asking them to review the construction of the History Center, take a look at the placement, the weights involved to make sure that we were within appropriate safety margins to bring an artifact of this size and this weight within the History Center. That was all part and parcel of the process of bringing it in. And when you see that process unfolding, when you see the spacecraft not only arrive, but then start to enter the building after 10 years of effort and planning and uh, discussion, that's an extraordinary experience. Uh, hopefully when people come to the exhibit to see the artifact, all of that will really not be visible because the focus should be on the artifact itself. It's got a special cradle that was custom designed by the Cosmosphere and it's within a custom designed special artifact case. And in fact, we had to have all those approved and reviewed by the Smithsonian before they would agree to send it here. So what you are seeing with this is really a unique, one of a kind, not only mount, but spacecraft and the enclosure for the spacecraft as well. That's part of what we try to do is to bring unique experiences and share experiences that you're not gonna find in other places.